Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to talk to you today about personalized prevention. And really, those two words don't necessarily roll off the tongue or, or fit well together, so let's unpack it just for a moment. Prevention's easy to understand because it's things like smoking cessation campaigns or a time to get your mammogram, but it's not at all personalized. In fact, I get the smoking cessation message even though I've never smoked in my life, and I get reminded to get my mammogram as well. <laughs> Personalization, on the other hand, is interesting, and it's actually breathtaking what companies like Apple, Google, Facebook, Pandora, Netflix are doing these days with personalization and taking those digital breadcrumbs that we leave behind every day and so many things that we do, putting them through algorithmic filters and serving up content to us that feels personalized. Of course, it's designed to make us do something, which is buy something. And what I want to reflect with you today on for a few minutes is, can we apply that to healthcare? And, and why aren't we applying that to healthcare? And it starts again with, with the data. We collect so much data. We have so much data at our disposal, whether it be your tweets, analyzing your text, where you bought your latte, the GPS coordinates of the McDonald's that you ate your lunch at. Your step count, if you measure your steps with a Fitbit or a Nike Fuel Band. If you measure your blood pressure, you can get a device now at the Apple Store to do that. All that information goes into the cloud and it's available to us to do interesting health tracking with. And we're doing pretty well already with this. We've had great success with this using these two concepts illustrated here, feedback loops which just means we take those objective data that we're collecting about you and we share them back with you. I was watching the New England Patriots uh, last weekend and it occurred to me that if diabetes and hypertension were like spraining your ankle, think how different the world would be. But they're not, they're silent. So these sensors that we have now allow us to give you feedback about how those conditions are affecting your life and how your life are affecting those conditions. So feedback loops are helpful and they allow us to have insights, set goals, keep healthcare top of mind. But for many of us, life gets in the way and we need motivators. And that's what I've illustrated here with this uh, slider concept. And the idea there is we're all motivated by different things and if we can mix those just right by knowing a little bit about you, again, by collecting data about you. Maybe we can hit on a motivational tool set that's just right for you and that will inspire you to use the feedback loop to take your health to a new level. And we've had good luck so far with that. We've done well with diabetes, hypertension, heart failure. But there's another stream of data coming which is really even more exciting and that's genetic data. And the thousand dollar genome is right around the corner. It really is. And what can we do with that? How could we mix that in to the mix as well? How could we map your risk for some of these chronic conditions and tailor programs according to that? Well, two stories come to mind to help illustrate that. The first is the story of Michael Snyder. He's the chair of genetics at Stanford. He's a geneticist, uh, expert in this area of personalized medicine. And he decided to do something fearless, which was to sequence his own genome and study his own risk. And this is what he found. It's called a riskogram. New word for me. But if you read this, what you see is the lozenges represent where the population is at risk for a given condition. If there's a black line to the left, that means that Dr. Snyder's at less risk for the general population for that condition. And if there's a brown line to the right, he's at greater risk. So you can see he's at less risk for prostate cancer 
in obesity, which is, is interesting. I've circled diabetes because that's what I want to talk about. So he's at far greater risk for type 2 diabetes and a bit greater risk for hyperlipidemia. Those two go hand in hand. But again, interesting that he's not at risk for diabetes because we often think of, uh, sorry, for obesity because we often think of obesity and, and diabetes as related. But what would you do if you had this information? Just think about it for a minute. Now, I'm curious if anyone in the audience who doesn't have diabetes routinely tracks their blood sugar. Anyone do that? Well, that's good because I would send you to a therapist. I think we, <laughs> we'd, we'd call that hypochondria, right? <laughs> but if you had this information, what would you do? Well, Dr. Snyder employed a connected health intervention. He started tracking his glucose and measuring his hemoglobin A1C. And you can see this rather fascinating curve. Now, in the beginning, nothing happens. Fasting glucose is around 100. That's normal. Uh, and if it gets above 120, that's problematic. A1C is just a longer phase method of calculating one's glucose load. And if that gets up around 7, you have frank diabetes. And sure enough, he's tracking, again, hypochondriac maybe, but by day 300, something happens, and his glucose starts to bump. And by day 350, he has full-blown type 2 diabetes. Now stop and look at the graph for a minute with me, because this is probably the first time in history we've been able to see something like this. Typically, people with type 2 diabetes have the condition for years before they get diagnosed because you can't feel it. But here he is watching himself develop the disease. So what's going to happen? Is its blood sugar going to keep going up? Will it stabilize? Will it come down? Is there a way to make it come down? We'll hold on to those thoughts. We'll come back to his story. But I want to share another interesting story. This is Tara Parker Pope. She's a reporter for the New York Times. And she writes about wellness, but she spent a lot of time writing about weight gain and the challenge of losing weight and keeping weight off. And she's delved into research on this that shows, for instance, that if you gain 10 pounds, many of us, and then you try to lose it, even though you're going back to your old weight, your body acts like it's starving, like it needs to gain that weight back for, for some of us. So this is interesting. She spent a lot of time writing about it and actually talking about her own struggle with weight openly. Well, it turns out that if you look at the genome, there are at least five, probably more, but five genotypes that we can relate to obesity that give people that risk for gaining that weight. One of them is called a thrifty genotype, which just means you hold on to fat longer. You, you move your metabolites into fat, and you hold on to it better. 50,000 years ago, that was probably a good thing to have in the jungle. But now that we're surrounded by Big Macs and 20-ounce sugary drinks, not so good. And then there's a hyperphagic genotype, which means your set point for feeling full is a little bit higher than the rest of us. And, and you can see the others as well. The point is, think about if we knew this information about you, in utero, and we are now doing genetic sequencing in utero, and we could put you on a program early in life that encouraged activity, that encouraged smart eating. You might get to the point where you never gain the 20 pounds that are so hard to lose. Dr. Snyder's story's got a happy ending. You can see here that he employed another connected health intervention. He started tracking his activity. He employed some dietary restrictions, and he basically put his type 2 diabetes in remission about 50 days later. So again, really interesting, really, really interesting graph. As I said earlier, I don't think you'll see anything like this, and this may be the first time in history we've seen it. But it tells us a lesson about the power of knowing the future based on your risk. So imagine if we could do that for all of you. Imagine if we knew what you were prone to and could halt that, could cut it off at the pass, could help you use feedback loops to put yourself in a better behavioral state. It would probably look like this. We'd know your motivational triggers which are unique for all of you. We know something about your phenotypic data based on connected health, and we know your genetic risk. 
And we can put all those into an algorithmic engine, just like Facebook does, just like Pandora does, and give you a unique motivational program to move your health to a new level. That's pretty exciting. That's personalized prevention, and I want to talk to you about it at the break. Thanks very much. <laughs>